Um, well, I wanted to start by um, thanking Marco Robnik and all the local organizers for a fantastic event and also for inviting me to be part of it. Um, I am a theoretical physicist by training and about 15 years ago or so I started collaborating with neuroscientists trying to understand the brain as, as a network that is capable of information processing. And um, let me start by showing you what your brain looks like. This is, this is the frontal part of your brain. This is your prefrontal cortex. This is the back of your brain. This is where you do all your visual processing. This is the cerebellum in the very, in the very back and bottom of your brain. And uh, you know, this is an important part of what makes us humans, as opposed distinct to other animals is that we have developed over millions and millions of years of evolution this magnificent organ through which we process all the information that comes through our sensory systems. We um, try to make sense out of it. We interpret it based on knowledge that we have accumulated previously in our life and that we store in the forms of memory. And then we use of this stored information plus the incoming information through the sensory system in order to act in the world, to make decisions, to move, to say something, to grab an object, all the things that you could consider the output of the, of the reasoning. And um, although, you know, sort of Dennis Noble made a very interesting point this morning that what makes us who we are is not just the brain, but is, even before we go to the level of a society, is an integration of the brain and all our body, and this is very true. It is, however, also true that all the incoming signals that we gather from our sensory receptors does come into the brain, and all the actions that we take as response to what happens in the world around us is guided by signals that are produced in the brain. So somehow the brain is this center processing unit where all this information needs to be combined so as to uh, allow us to, to act and to move as humans. Uh, I'm not sure, there. So uh, there has been a tradition of assigning roles and functionality to different areas of the brain. This tradition comes mostly, unfortunately, from, from starts at the end of the first war and even more so at the end of the second war by looking essentially at people who have suffered very traumatic head injuries and looking at what their deficits were in terms of what they were able to do or not able to do and trying to correlate that with the site of the injuries. So out of that, we know that there are areas in the brain. We know, again, this is the back of your brain. This is the occipital lobe. That's where your primary visual cortex is. This is the beginning that signals go through your eyes, through an intermediate region that is called the thalamus, to the primary visual cortex, and that's where you begin to make sense out of the visual scene that your world, the, that your brain, your eyes capture. That is the, this prefrontal, frontal, and prefrontal area. We believe that that is the site of the executive functions where we really analyze the most abstract information, where we try to make decisions. And this is an area that I'm particularly interested in. It's a little bit of a strip. You could think that goes, it's like when you put your, your head speakers. It goes from ear to ear and around the head. And it's the, the motor cortex and the frontal part of the sensory cortex. This is where your sensory motor integration gets put together. It is, in some sense, an important part for this input output of the brain, where I see something, I want to reach for it, I hear something, I want to turn my head towards it to understand what's going on. So it's this transformation from sensory inputs to motor inputs that takes place in that area. Now this big uh, mass is, um, as, um, as we heard today, we are not uh, seal men, but car men. So we are made of carbon and not of silicon. So this piece of meat that is inside our cranium, because that's what it is, if you open it up, it's just, you know, it's a piece of, of meat and, and irrigated by blood like any other muscle or any other part of your body, 
is where we have all this enormous amount of information processing capabilities. And what is distinctive about this organ if in your body as opposed to other organs if you're in your body is that it's made of these very specific type of cells which are called neurons. So these, these are different types of neurons and these are beautiful drawings that come from uh, Spanish anatomy called uh, Ramon y Cajal. He began to make these uh, neuron drawings at the beginning of the 20th century when it was possible for the first time to stain these neurons due to the Golgi stain and he began to make these magnificent drawings and it's amazing how rich they are and how true to life they are now that we have very sophisticated methods for trying to do the same kind of, trying to take a picture of what a neuron looks like. Well, you have a lot of these neurons. You have about 85 billion neurons in your brain. And now, nowadays, because of all this financial crisis, we all have a very good sense of what a billion is. You know, it used to be that a billion seemed like an impossible number to achieve, but now we all have a pretty good sense of what's a billion. So you have 85 billion neurons ab about in your brain. And about uh, 15 billion of those are in your cortex, which is this outer part of the brain, this most evolved part of the brain, which is where most of this interesting information processing takes place. Neurons come in a, in a very wide variety, and I think that's an important aspect of this complexity that we have been discussing. So Steve Bishop talked talk earlier today about systems that have many degrees of freedom. The connectivity is very important, either explicit connectivity or implicit connectivity. And um, Tassos just told us about how the fact that these, these many degrees of freedom or many components of the system interact with each other is very important because then you see an emergent complexity at the level of the network, at the level of the whole ensemble, which is much more than what you would be able to extract from each one of the components, from the individual components. So it's not that each neuron can do such a great job, but once you put 85 billion of them together and you connect them to each other so that they can they are capable of collective interactive action, then you get something that is, as a device, capable of great complexity in its function. But one important aspect that hasn't perhaps been emphasized up to earlier today is that diversity is a very important component of a complex system. One of the things that make these systems very interesting, in particular makes the brain very interesting, is that it's made of 85 billion neurons, but these neurons are not all identical to each other. They are not little copies of each other. Actually, they come in a great variety, and I wanted to put this, this slide up, first of all, to show you how beautiful some of these neurons are. These Purkinje cells, well, this drawing doesn't make justice to it. The Purkinje cell is much more beautiful than that. It looks like lace made in Brussels, you know, sort of it's absolutely lovely, and it's the kind of neurons that you find in the cerebellum. Then there are these beautiful pyramidal cells that are very important to making us who we are. They are the, the large majority of the excitatory neurons in the cortex. And then there's a whole variety of what is called inhibitory neurons, neurons that try to keep everything quieted down, that come in all sorts of forms and shapes. And I truly believe that diversity is a very important component of these highly interconnected systems that we call complex systems. And that when we create models, it's important to remember that not only we have to have many components connected to each other, but that these components should not be identical replicas of each other. If there has to be several populations with slightly diverse capabilities that come together. And that's a very important uh, component of what makes a system functionally rich, capable of of implementing or acting out or manifesting a large variety of functions. So keep that in mind. Homogeneous systems, even if they have many components and you interconnect them, are going to be always more limited in their capabilities than heterogeneous systems that are made of subpopulations that are different from each other. And then everything gets mixed up and interconnected. And the brain is indeed an heterogeneous system. So this is what neurons look like. Neurons are little input-output devices. They are cells, they have a body, and they have a nucleus, like any you know, self, like any legal cell, any self-respecting cell. They have this kind of ramified structure called the dendritic tree. This is where they collect information. 
information that is coming from many other neurons make contact with this neuron, these little contacts called synapses, in different areas of the dendritic tree. <laughs> This neuron processes information, and if the, something interesting has happened, it decides to communicate it to the other neurons that it connects to through this long, long appendix that comes out of it that is called an axon. And if you put an electrode here very close to the axon, I'll show you in the next uh, slide, you will see this electrical activity traveling down the axon so that it can be propagated and communicated to other neurons, and this axon ramifies and makes synapses again with the dendritic tree of other neurons that are downstream from this one, from the information processing point of view. So if you put an electrode here, what you'll be able to monitor is the actual electrical voltage on the inside of that neuron. And this is what you will see. You will see an electrical voltage that fluctuates a little bit, but every now and then, a very important event happens. It's a very short event of a very short duration. It's called a spike or an action potential. And then everything goes back to normal. And this action potential travels down the axon of the neuron. And this is the way in which this neuron communicates with the other neurons in the brain. So the action potentials or spikes are the currency that neurons use to communicate with each other. They are very, very short. Here, here I show just a spike here. You have an amplified drawing of a spike. It's, you know, it lasts less than one millisecond. And if you put this electrode, as I had shown you before, here, eventually you will see you know, many of these action potentials going by, and you'll see a train of action potentials that, that is called a raster of action potentials. It's just a description of the, of the little signals that were emitted by this neuron. Here went one, then a, a next, the next one. And this is an indication of what the activity of this neuron was. So um, neurons typically fire, depends on which neurons and which area of the brain. But on average, I think we could say they, on average, they fire about 10 spikes or action potential per second. So if you have 85 billion neurons, and each one of them makes about 10 spikes per second, you have 150 billion spikes being made and traveling around your brain in every second. Now, 150 billion spikes, just think of it, compare it, for instance, with that's 20 times the population of the world. And that is happening in your brain every second. These spikes are being made, are being sent, um, you know, within, from one neuron to the next one, and all this activity is, contains information, is the language that the brain is using to encode the information that is coming in and to encode what you think are your thoughts, your decisions. So when, um, when Dennis was telling earlier today, I decide to play the guitar, is because something has happened in his brain. There is a signal in his brain that is telling his hand, Dennis has decided to play the guitar. And it should be possible, so this is my dream as a theorist, that if somebody could give me a snapshot so that every second I can see which neurons have fired and how many action potentials, would I be able to decode this language? Would I be able to find the Rosetta Stone so that I could tell by looking at all these spikes, now Dennis wants to play the guitar or now Dennis wants to read a book instead of playing the guitar? Because it all has to be encoded somehow in this magnificent language, which is the language of the spikes going around your brain. So it turns out that now we can actually do that in a limited fashion. I mean, you know, it's. Of course, it's not 85 billion neurons, but now we are very proud that we have devices, I will show you in a second, that allow us to monitor of the order of 100 neurons at a time. It is a lot compared to one neuron. It is very little compared to 15 billion or 85 billion, but now we try to begin to make sense out of this kind of data. So on this plot, here is time. So this is a recording that has lasted about half a second, less than, yeah, about half a second. And each row here is, is a label for a neuron. It's a, it's a neuron address or neuron name, you know, neuron number one, neuron number two, arbitrary names that we give to these neurons. And for instance, here we have neuron number 40. It made a spike here, then it made a spike there, then it made a spike, a spike, another spike, then it was quiet for a while, then it made two more spikes. So this is what these drawings make. I mean, these drawings are a recording of all the spikes made 
by these neurons. And the great thing about these recordings is that we are able to make them in awake behaving animals. So that not only I can see what these 100 neurons are doing, but I can also know what the animal or even the human, I'm going to show you data for the human, is doing. So this is the tool to begin to create the dictionary, to begin to break the code and to understand how to correlate neural activity with actual activity of the organism. So this is the great uh, experimental tool that has allowed us to do this, this multi-electrode arrays. This is a 10 by 10 electrode array, about 800 electrodes. It measures um, four millimeters by four millimeters. This is supposed to be your thumb so that you get the sense for how small it actually is. So it's 400 microns between adjacent electrodes. So because we are interested in, in the lab that I collaborate with mostly in how neurons control motion, we implant these electrodes in this area that is called the motor cortex. Remember from year to year, so we put it in an area of the motor cortex. Your motor cortex has a little map of yourself. So, and, and we know that because if you put an, a little wire and you inject the current instead of recording, you will see it twitched. And, and depending on what twitches, you will know where in, the, in this motor cortex you are. So maybe your foot twitches or your mouth twitches upwards. So somebody will see you're smiling, but you're not smiling. Somebody just put an electron on your brain and the mouth goes up. And, uh, so we really are, to a large extent, what our brains make us to be. So this is what people call a homunculus, which is a map of how your body is represented along this, this motor cortex. So we put this multi-electrode array in the arm area of the motor cortex, and we ask monkeys or humans, I'll show you some human data, so say, to make a very stereotypical task of arm reaches, very simple to begin with, to see if we can correlate neural activity with motion, if we can begin to break that code. It's a very, very simple reaching task. We use mostly this one called the center out task. You hold the lever at the center. You keep on holding the lever at the center. A target flashes, very short flash, 50 milliseconds in one out of eight positions around the central target. You wait until you get the go signal, and then you make a reach to that, uh, to that target. And all the time while you're doing this, we are recording what the, mod, the neurons in this area, arm area of your motor cortex are doing. So, how do I lower the volume? Volume, volume, volume. A little bit. So this is the monkey doing the task, and what you hear are the neurons being recorded. Dormers, dormers at the site. So the monkey is reaching the target, exactly as I told you, being recorded. You can see the, you can see the, the sweet juice that the monkey is drinking. And he's doing exactly the task. You don't see the lights because the lights are facing the monkey, not the, not the movie. But he's doing this, you know, he touches, goes to center, goes to the target, comes back, and gets rewarded because he, he has done the right, the right thing. So um, all the time while the monkey is doing this very simple task, we are using the multi-electrode array to record what the neurons are doing. This is again a drawing like I showed you before. Every one of these dots is a spike, and you can, you can see then the activity of this. Of this. Typically, we can always sort out between 80, 100, sometimes 110 neurons. And this is when you hear brrr, brrr, these, these brrrs that you heard are actually the spikes, the barrels of spikes going by. So now this is the first simple exercise of learning this spike language. So here is the monkey playing this center out task to different targets every time. It's one of eight targets. I color coded them. So here was, you know, I reached to the yellow target, the red target, the blue target. So the monkey has seen the target, but it hasn't received the go signal yet, but he's prepared to move in that direction. So I make this little window, 300 milliseconds, and I count how many spikes have I seen in each one of those neurons. If I count the number of neurons and I divide it by the size of the, of the bin, 300 milliseconds, I get a rate. I get how many spikes per unit time are being made by that neuron. And that is, you could think of this as a word, a word of numbers. Neuron one is firing at the rate of five spikes per second. Neuron two at seven spikes per second. There is a pattern of firing. And the question is, 
If I tell you what is this pattern of firing, and this pattern of firing, and this pattern of firing, would you be able to tell me to which one of the targets the monkey is going to go, not having seen it, of course, I'm not, not allowing you to see the display, and before the monkey actually starts the motion? Can you predict what's going to be the motion of the animal just for listening or monitoring this neural activity? So this is the whole idea behind a new way of doing systems neuroscience, which is called brain-machine interfaces, which we call really converting thoughts into actions. So we record this neural activity, we transform it numerically, and then instead of having the monkey execute an action, we use it to guide a computer cursor or a robotic arm on the outside that is actually executing the actions that the animal was going to execute, and we can make this external device do that because we have been able to translate out of the neural activity what were the instructions that were being conveyed to this external device, which in this case was the NAR. This is a relatively new idea. It was first proposed in 1980 and uh, by Schmidt, who suggested that maybe we could use the recordings from a single neuron from motor cortex as a possible source of signals for the control of external devices. So when he first proposed this paper, I mean, you couldn't possibly get it published today because it's, a, it's totally speculative. He doesn't, you know, he says, oh, I should have an amplifier, of course, and then a little transistor and an added to the converter, and then, you know, here is the monkey and he's being rewarded, and then a light would move to the right or to the left, and either two steps or four, and it would all work out. But it was just purely speculative. It was like a science fiction proposal, and it's only 30 years ago and now we can absolutely uh, do that, which is like a miracle. So let me show you what is done today. So this is again the electrode array, four millimeters by four millimeters. And here I'm showing you surgeries of these electrode arrays. This is implanted in a monkey's two electrode arrays, one of them in motor cortex and the other one in sensory cortex. This is also a monkey with two electrode array, motor cortex and premotor cortex, and this is a human. This is a paraplexic uh, patient participating in a clinical trial at Brown University in the lab of John Donahue. So this has been implanted in the motor area of this human brain, and this is the recording. This is now recording, this is H23, HS23, is human subject number three, HS3, from area M1, 110 neurons, and this is again, and the, and the human subject is doing the same centered out task that I showed you the monkey was doing. And we are recording of, of the order of 110 neurons. And again, every little tick is a spike that has been recording and recording. And now I can ask the same question. I say, can I construct the coders? Can I construct a dictionary that will allow me to translate this neural activity into a desired motion? And let me just tell you a little bit about this. So this is, this is one of the patients in that uh, in that clinical trial, this is how it's the, the connectors to the electron in his brain, and he's been playing, I'll show you a movie at the end, because for some reason it was not working embedded in the, in the talk. I will show you that he's playing the same center of task that the monkey was, was playing before, so I'll show you the movie a bit later. But let me just tell you just a couple of sentences about how we do this. I don't want to go into the mathematics of how we construct this dictionary. But let me just uh, go back to this example. So for each one of the targets, we gather data, and when we gather this data, we measure what is the fighting rate of each one of these 100 or so neurons. And this is the only formula I'm going to show you. We define, we call the neuron I. I could be one, two, three, four, five, is the, the label that we gave each neuron. We compute the fighting rate for neuron I by counting the number of spikes that were emitted by neuron I during this little beam and dividing it by the duration delta of that beam. So we get a number of spikes per second, a number of spikes per unit time. Now, if I'm recording 100 neurons, every time I see a point like this, I'm going to get a fighting rate. I'm going to get a list of 100 fighting rates. And I could plot that as a point in a, in a space that has 100 dimensions. Now, I can't do that, so I ask your imagination to kick in to go outside this box, which is here just a three-dimensional box. So here I'm showing you three neurons. Neuron number 70, neuron number 46, neuron number 
78, and each one of these points corresponds to one of those reaches. But actually, I don't know these for three neurons, I know them for 110. So think of a, a space like this in 110 dimensions. So after I put the point, I color them because I actually know to which target the monkey went, and I look at this and I look at this and say, well, what's there is no rhyme of reason or reason to this, you know. Everything is mixed up, all the targets are mixed up. How am I going to translate this? How am I going to extract from this the targets? Well, this is where mathematics, again, is surprisingly useful. You know, as a scientist, I'm always surprised, not only by the beauty of mathematics, but by the fact that it gives us tools to actually understand the natural world. To me, you know, after 30 years after my PhD, this is still not obvious and it's still a, a source of great pleasure and great surprise that mathematics is indeed the language of nature. It allows us to describe nature in a quantitative manner. So we observe that the, although these points are everywhere, as we gather more and more points, they don't really fill the space. They seem to live in a going again back to the idea of dimensionality reduction that Tassos was describing before, they seem to live in a surface which is not flat, it's curved, but it's low dimensional. It's like if I can put, you know, sort of a, if I can put this object and curve it a little bit, it's a two-dimensional object living in a three-dimensional space. And I could have this two-dimensional object living in a hundred-dimensional space, it still would be a two-dimensional object. So we find these objects which are curvy. I'm, I'm almost done. We find these objects, we project all these points into these objects, and this is what we find. We find this organization where suddenly all the points are clustered. Not only they are clustered, but all the points going to target one are next to the points going to target two, next to the point going to target three. So in that space, there is a neural representation of the task that the animal was doing. And this is the kind of mathematics that allows us to build our decoders. So this is where I wanted to end. I'll, I'll show you, if I may, the movie of the human subject doing the task, or I can show you privately if it's too late. Okay, then I'll just, I'll just stop here and I can show you the movie to those who are interested. So essentially what we wa I wanted to say is that the fact that we can simultaneously record this population activity, not single neurons but multiple neurons, begin to give us insight about the network and the properties of the network. We can do a mathematical analysis of this neural activity and in the case of arm reaches, it allows us to predict the direction of motion of the arm. And then not only that, but in the case of patients like the human on which this um, was done, the fact that we can extract information about the intended motion gives us a tool that helps us guide prosthetic arms and create devices that help people who have actually lost the ability to use their brains to move their own bodies. And I'll stop there. Thank you.